Hello. Hello, and welcome to today's City Club Forum. My name is Ralph Delarada, and it is my pleasure to serve as the president of the City Club of Cleveland this year. Established in October of 1912, the City Club has served as one of the nation's premier public podiums for civil dialogue, covering the most pressing topics of our time. Our guest speakers, rich in experience and knowledge, are here to spur discussion and learning among the citizens of Cleveland. I am very, very pleased to introduce our important guest today, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the Honorable Michael Chertoff. Secretary Chertoff is in charge of protecting the American homeland and ensuring the safety of all American citizens. The Senate unanimously confirmed him on February 15, 2005, as the second public official to take this important position. It is widely believed that this is one of the most important jobs in the United States government, especially since the horror of September 11th changed our notions of national security. The United States is now facing new contemporary dangers. The threat of terrorism extends far beyond conventional, conventional weapons or explosives and can range from destructive biological and radioactive weapons to the cyber terrorist threat to our nation's infrastructure. It is Secretary Chertoff's job to spearhead the United States defenses against such real and formidable threats. Mr. Chertoff has stressed the importance of patience and perseverance in these times, despite the fact that we have not experienced a terrorist attack in our country in the past seven years. Indeed, Secretary Chertoff has warned, quote, there are some people who believe the current generation of terrorists want a big visible bang. But you know, the next generation may not want a big visible bang. They might take a quiet satisfaction watching the entire financial system shudder. He has stated that the great weapon they have is persistence and patience. And the one weakness that we have is our tendency to lose patience and become complacent. Our biggest challenge is making sure we do not drop our guard because time passes. Often, acting in the name of homeland defense can prove to be controversial. Delicate balances must be struck between privacy and security, especially in this age of blurring lines between our personal and our public lives. Additionally, many Americans call for increased government transparency, although it remains important to avoid compromising our defense initiatives. Obviously, some will not be happy with the paths chosen by our government, but Secretary Chertoff often reiterates that he wants to cooperate with private institutions and the public in finding the right equilibrium. Secretary Chertoff previously acted as United States Circuit Judge for the Third Circuit Court of Appeals after his Senate confirmation in 2003. Before this, he served as Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice. In this capacity, he helped trace the 9-11 terrorist attacks to the Al-Qaeda network, formed the Enron Task Force, which produced more than 20 convictions, and worked to increase information sharing within the FBI and with state and local officials. Secretary Chertoff has also spent over a decade as a federal prosecutor in New Jersey and New York. In these positions, he investigated and personally prosecuted significant cases of political corruption, organized crime, and corporate fraud. <laughs> Mr. Chertoff graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College in 1975 and magna cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1978. He is married to Mary Justin and has two children. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to introduce such a diligent and accomplished public servant. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Michael Chertoff to the City Club. <laughs> Well, Ralph, I want to thank you for that kind introduction. I want to thank you for inviting me to address this distinguished forum, which I'm told is the second oldest of its kind across the country. And I saw, looking at the photo gallery outside, you've had a lot of important people uh, and distinguished people speak. So I'm not quite sure why I'm in the, included in that number, but I appreciate the privilege. I came uh, from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a few minutes ago where I met with uh, Secretary Voinovich and a number of business leaders and people from the community to talk about some of what we are doing 
in the area of trying to balance security with respect to people coming into the United States, uh, focused on the northern border, but also looking more generally, <clears throat> and balancing that with the need to have efficient flow of people and trade so that we can have the benefit of our prosperity. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a couple of the measures that I talked about earlier uh, that relate to the question of how we bring people in in a way that is safe and secure, but also efficient and convenient. And then to broaden the general discussion to what I think is a, a somewhat larger theme that runs through a lot of <clears throat> what we're doing in Homeland Security, which is the issue of identity protection and identity management. Uh, I believe one of the great challenges of the 21st century. Well, there were a couple of things I talked about at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the meeting we had with community leaders. One of them is the new uh, uh, electronic system of travel authorization, which is an electronic program we have to get advanced information from travelers from those countries that do not currently require a visa to come to the U.S. As you may know, so-called visa waiver countries, most of which are in Western Europe, uh, do not require the, uh, we don't require a visa for tourists who come in uh, for 90 days or less. For many years, the Eastern European countries have sought to have the same privilege. And, and that desire has only grown since uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And it was not something we were able to accomplish uh, until this year when we were able to combine that strong impulse to broaden the visa waiver program with the creation of an electronic system whereby every country in the program, both those currently coming in and those coming in in the future, would move to a system of advanced electronic notification <clears throat> to all authorities for all travelers coming to the U.S. To put it more simply, under this electronic system, uh, the traveler uh, gets an authorization to come to the U.S., assuming they're in a visa waiver country, simply by filing online the kind of application you used to fill out when you're on the airplane, the single paper form. And then we have an opportunity to take a little bit of additional time to review it and to determine if there's a problem with your admissibility into the U.S. so that we can make that judgment before someone gets on a plane as opposed to when they've arrived and they present themselves at the airport. <clears throat> I thought in many ways this was a great metaphor for the challenge I was going to talk about because the electronic system adds security it gives us more time to check the information about travelers, but it also adds convenience. It allows us to tell people before they get on a plane that there's a problem, so they don't have to fly in and then turn around and go back. And it's also been the opportunity <clears throat> to give us, um, an, to first give an invitation to those countries from Eastern Europe that have not been able to participate in the program to join beginning this year. It is my hope uh, and my expectation, assuming all the requirements are met, that uh, before the end of this calendar year, several of the Baltic states and Eastern European countries that have been waiting for many years to come, uh, become part of the visa waiver program, will see the first of their citizens getting on airplanes to come to the U.S. to visit uh, without having to have visas. That's going to be a positive element for convenience and for the efficiency of travel from those countries. But you know the most important thing it's going to do? It's going to show the people of the Baltics and Eastern Europe that we stand with them side by side and we welcome them into a relationship of friendship and a bond of trust that we have extended to our older allies in Western Europe. And I have to say, if you look at world events, if you look at what's going on in the Caucasus, uh, this, there cannot be a better time to send that message of public diplomacy of our standing shoulder to shoulder with Eastern Europe than this particular moment when there are other forces who act in a, in a fashion that can be fairly described as intimidating and hostile. <clears throat>